A lot of the conduct is uh, borderline illegal and in many cases is illegal under current law. Uh, so it's definitely egregious wrongdoing. Uh, and you can see why the government wants to increase penalties. So charging dead people fees. Uh, in the case of AMP, which is slightly outside the Royal Commission, uh, purporting to ask that you're providing services that you're not doing, uh, encouraging customers to take on more debt than they can actually service. A lot of this behaviour is already illegal, if not highly unethical. Do you think those penalties go far enough? Should they go a bit further? Well, for individuals, the penalties seem quite stiff. Uh, so 10 years in prison, up to a million dollars in fines. Those can be significantly, they can significantly deter individuals. For corporations, that's another question. Uh, so if we think about Wells Fargo recently, Wells Fargo has recently fined a billion dollars in the US for conduct that's somewhat similar to what's being discussed in the Banking Royal Commission. So the penalties discussed here are somewhat similar to what the US is looking at. Whether they go far enough is another question. Because if we think about a bank being fined up to, in some cases, $945 million. If we think about that, so for some banks, that could be a drop in the ocean, right? Uh, particularly given how egregious some of the wrongdoing can sometimes be and how destabilizing some of it can be. We've already seen uh, one major casualty this past week, the, uh, the chief executive AMP having stepped down. Where does the buck stop in these cases? In other words, who's culpable? Not just as far as at the executive level, what about at board level? Are we likely to see casualties there as well? Uh, well, as you've correctly said, the CEO is generally going to be accountable for this. Uh, now, in some cases, the CEO could be acting in good conscience. They could have good risk management procedures. In every, in every corporation, there will always be bad apples, right? So there'll sometimes be corporations where, despite their best efforts, they just haven't been able to stamp out wrongdoing. But in general terms, it's going to be the CEO that's going to be responsible. In many cases, the board might also be responsible. Now, it's really going to depend on what the board has done to oversee that CEO. So the CEO's responsibility is to manage the company. The board has to oversee the CEO. If they've been negligent in doing that, then the board potentially could be removed. The shareholders would have to go about doing that, though. Uh, and if we think about current regulations, board members can be penalised for violating the Corporations Act, for example, which would potentially involve some of the conduct here. So board members could be penalised, they could be banned from being on future boards. Yeah, because some questions raised over the role played by the chairwoman of, of AMP mm -hmm. as to whether she uh, actively knew what was going on. Suggestions perhaps there was even some sort of cover-up in, in their internal investigation. Yeah, that obviously should result in board members being removed. Uh, if there's a cover-up, if they knew about the wrongdoing, or alternatively, if they should have known. Uh, so we have to think about both A, did they know, and B, were they reckless about whether they didn't know? So willfully blind, for example. And willful blindness, so that is simply not going through the procedures you should be doing, uh, shouldn't be an excuse. That shouldn't let you off the hook. There's also been discussion this week about whether banks should be providing this financial advice at all. Is there too much of a conflict of interest in that? Can they do that independently? Uh, in some cases they can, in some cases they can't. It's really, or in some cases they shouldn't rather. It really is a case-by-case -case situation. Uh, so if we're thinking about insurance advice, so that's been some of the issue that's arisen uh, in terms of whether they're providing insurance that people really didn't need. Uh, advice in terms of, say, superannuation or financial products, that's another issue. Now, for many of these banks, those types of services are directly in their wheelhouse. So, for example, uh, financial services such as uh, investment advice, that can be the type of thing a bank is apt to be able to provide. The real issue is whether the uh, incentives are such that people are being funneled investment products they shouldn't they shouldn't be taking on. Uh, so banks, I think, should still be able to provide these products, but there needs to be oversight about whether they're providing appropriate advice. And that would involve both uh, detection of whether there's inappropriate advice and adequate penalties if there's inappropriate advice. Mark, what's the feeling among you and your colleagues uh, give, as this is transpiring? And we heard from Alan Fells, the former head of the ACCC, talking uh, this past week about, further to that, perhaps the need to break up the bank, certainly separate retail banking from financial mm. advice. What, what's your thought on that? It's really a case-by-case -case basis as to what exact financial advice we should remove. Uh, so in many cases, these banks can still provide some financial advice without, uh, without a conflict of interest, and they can do that adequately well. And in many of the cases we've looked at in the Royal Commission, the conduct has been borderline illegal in many cases. Uh, so 
it currently is prescribed by, by current law. Now, if we think about, say, the United States, the United States hasn't quite gone down that path fully. Um, in many cases, there is regulation, there is oversight that can prevent this from occurring. Uh, at this stage, it's not clear to me that we need to break up the banks per se, uh, as opposed to having additional oversight, additional compliance, and additional penalties to deter wrongdoing.